Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast Episode 87. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Scott Johnson. And as we do every time, we have two guests joining us to share their particular perspectives on what the future will hold. Uh, joining us today, Leslie Horn, reporter at PCMag.com, sandwich enthusiast, and <laughs> member of the Museum of Natural History. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you for having me. You come with a long list of excellent credentials. <laughs> Especially, especially that sandwich bit. I can't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear more throughout the show about your predictions dealing with sandwiches, hopefully. Uh, that's probably the subject matter that I have the most predictions on. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> and an excellent uh, food for any meal. Joining us also is Joyce Hostin, Director of Customer Experience at Open Text, Design Thinker, and Avid Gardener. I got to see some pictures of her garden at uh, PAB up in uh, Ottawa a couple months ago. How's it going, Joyce? <laughs> Oh, well, it's going really well. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. What is your opinion on sandwiches? <laughs> Ooh, I love sandwiches, actually. Oh, good. I was hoping, I'm glad we can avoid that controversy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start off with a uh, prediction from one of our listeners emailed to forecastpodcast at gmail.com. First one comes from Camden in Japan. Uh, is he in the chat room? His name's Origami Freak in the chat room. I haven't seen him in there. Say hi if you're in the chat room, Camden. Uh, he says, hello, Tom, Scott, and guests. My prediction is that many more houses and other buildings in the future will be built into the earth instead of on top of it. It might not seem very appealing to live underground, but with modern technology, you wouldn't have to live like a caveman. For example, you could bring natural light in with fiber optics or solar tubes, and simulated natural scenery and audio could be brought in using virtual windows and speakers. Living underground also has many advantages, such as an 80 percent reduction in cooling or heating costs, resistance to extreme weather, and good noise insulation. Underground houses would also be particularly beneficial to countries like Japan, which is 74 percent mountainous. We have the technology. It's just our perception that needs to change. I personally look forward to living like a hobbit, says Camden. Mm, I'm a fan of big cavernous space. I like caves. Uh, there's, um, there's some caves near us that we go to once in a while. You have to hike real high to get Go to them. Spelunking? Yeah, they, used to, they got like the slag tights and the mites and all that kind of cool stuff. And they have ponds and all kind of weird water uh, stuff in there. And I, I think that's really cool. And I would, I'd love to live in something like that. But I still say there's an issue with uh, human beings and our need for natural sunlight. And I think we would have to be pretty quick about coming up with ways to replicate that. Um, and figure out, you know, how much of it do we need? How much of it can we live without? What happens if we get forced to the surface again? There are a lot of issues with that, I believe. Well, he says uh, fiber optics and solar tubes. Yeah, but still. Well, well, so, okay, I don't know exactly how those would work, but I assume that they would pipe in some measure of sunlight. But it's, yeah, I, don't, I just don't know that it's enough. Is there a way to take that and say, all right, this community of whatever town, ville, inside of this one part of the giant cave, you, you know, this is enough of a daily dose of sunlight for you to survive. You think I don't know. It? It, it, maybe, and maybe I'm wrong about how much sunlight we need really to survive. Perhaps we would get used to it, but I know I've got to have it, you know, somewhat regularly. I need to be able to go, ah, the sun and it feels good and that vitamin D and the whatnot. So unless we have really good ways to, to make up for that, that scares me just a little bit. Joyce, you're a gardener. I mean, this, this obviously <laughs> has issues for that if, you, if you're having to live totally away from the surface. I think you need natural spectrum light. I know someone who moved to Vancouver and the real estate agent only showed them houses with really big windows because they said coming from out where we have sunlight, if you went to Vancouver, you'd need that light from the days you did have sun so you didn't get all depressed. If you're underground, I don't know, you'd need some way of natural spectrum lighting to simulate sunlight and you would need plants around you somehow. I don't think we could, I, I think 
we would end up in deep depression otherwise. On the other hand, Interesting. Leslie, you might get a bigger apartment. <laughs> uh, you, I mean, in theory, I think it's a good idea, but uh, we New Yorkers tend to suffer from seasonal affective disorder. I don't know how I'd feel about having to fight that year round. Um, I like my sunlight. Even in the winter, I need to uh, you know, spend some time outside every day. Leslie, so I do don't you know get, if it would work for do you, me. Do you get, does it hit you kind of hard in the winter? It does me. I hate it. Like I, I have to spend more. When the sun's out, I gotta, even if it's freezing out, I got to go spend time in it. We get a pretty full winter here like New York does. Do you feel like you know, that, that you would specifically have trouble with this? Uh, you, you know what? I grew up in Texas, um, and we do not know what snow is there. So I, I would definitely have a problem with it. I would, I would not be able to live underground. What part of Texas did you grow up in? I grew up in Dallas. Okay, so yeah, you did, you get a little, you get a little dusting every once in a while, but not. <laughs> yeah, you know that you threat, uh, you give us the threat of ice, and they will shut the entire state down. Yeah, I know, I know how that goes. Joyce is on the opposite end. She's like, if there's not ice, they shut the entire. No. Yeah, <laughs> I was in Dallas once, and they had some snow, a few flecks, and there was this big weather warning and, and news articles about how to dress and how you not freeze to death and how do you drive. And I was sitting there yeah. thinking, geez, a few flakes and the city shut down. There was there was a there was a dusting of snow in Austin one time when I was living there. They actually uh, didn't call us but closed work, and so I showed up at work. It was me, a woman who had grown up in Minnesota, and a guy from Germany. Were the only people who were like, why didn't anyone call and tell us? They're like, well, it was obvious there was snow. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. anyway, makes I, sense. I like, of, of course, this idea comes from uh, someone in Japan. I think that makes sense. They're, they're amazing at figuring out how to use every square inch of space uh, to its best advantage. So maybe it would work better in, in a place like Japan. And I think I, I think we're we're undervaluing the uh, fiber optic solar tube part of this. I think you could have sunrooms possibly that give you a lot if not all, but a lot of the of the sunlight you need. And you can always go outside still. I mean, I think, all right. you know. Let's, I, let's do this. Yeah. Chud, I'm ready to be a chud, Tom. If you're ready to be a chud, we can be chuds together. Let's go. All right. Uh, just real quickly, Leslie, I think when you when you type, we may get a little noise on your mic. Uh, oh. so just getting a little so I was uh, taking notes on my Oh, taking oh. notes. Okay. Uh, just that, not that you can't take notes, but just be aware that I think, you're, I think your mic's just scraping against something. <laughs> so it happens. Yeah, yeah. Don't no worries. I didn't. I didn't want to embarrass you, but I didn't know other way, any other way to tell you. <laughs> I'm mortified. <laughs> All right. Send us your predictions. Email forecastpodcast at gmail dot com or post them up at forecastpodcast dot com. Let's get into the short term predictions. Uh, and Leslie, we'll start with you uh, when you look into the near future. What do you see? Okay, so I think we're starting to see people a little bit irked by social media. Um, especially Facebook with privacy issues. And I think um, in the next several years, we're going to start to see a little bit of an exodus from Facebook. Um, I think, you know, especially with uh, an increasing number of features that are added, such as facial um, recognition technology that kind of bother people, um, you're going to start to pe see people get fed up. And I think maybe we'll see that social media at least in some aspects is kind of a passing trend well there's also the fear right that we there's a cycle and the cycle is coming back around to the point where perhaps facebook will be on the losing end of that cycle and we've seen it happen before with other services and while this is still kind of a brave new world there's a there's always this period of backlash they get so big people resent the, the size of things at, at facebook and they start to sort of fight against it they do it with apple they do it with microsoft they do it with everybody uh in tech or that they tend to and it seems to be this usual cycle what is it they can do do you think to not have this happen do they do they pull back and not innovate or in their minds innovate or and, and do they just say all right we're just going to focus on what we've already done and what people already like and we're going to just shore that up or do they do they lose out in the long run because they're not you know pushing new technologies that may or may not be perceived as as bad for privacy? I suppose one of the one of the keys there is um, what we've seen this week with LinkedIn. Um, they debuted social ads recently, um, made a change to their privacy policy that allowed them to cull data from your profile and use it in advertisements. 
people got pretty pissed off. Um, Facebook, in the same um, in the same vein, uh, has features that are opt out rather than opt in. I think they need to be thinking of it um, in the opposite direction. Let people choose the features they want rather than saying, here are the features you have. If you don't want them, you can get rid of them. They need to make it a more user-generated uh, experience. Do you think Google Joyce Plus is oh. making any better uh, progress against that? All right, so I'm a nerd and I'm a social media nerd, so um, I'm really enjoying Google Plus. The interface is much cleaner, and I think they are doing a better job letting you decide how you want it to work. But it's early, so it's really hard to make predictions about Google Plus, I think. Um, Facebook, though, I think, you know, you're seeing people get increasingly more pissed off. And with 750 million members, how many more people can you add? Yeah. Joyce, are you active in Facebook? How do you feel about its, its current um, day status and yeah. maybe its future? Yeah, I'm actually not active in Facebook. I keep thinking I should try Facebook. I signed in three years ago, made an account, and haven't been back ever since. And I think it's the, you know, the privacy things. I haven't found a compelling use case or reason myself to go in there and connect. And I use Twitter, and I find Twitter fine for connecting. The privacy parts of Facebook have worried me, so that's probably why I haven't gone back in there and really gotten to know how to use it. Hmm. So, and then, Jared, yeah. have, you, have you dabbled at all in, uh, in Google Plus or any other platforms? I do you find any, Do you think any of that stuff's Google worth your Plus. time or? Yeah. I keep thinking I gotta go in there and play with it. And Google Plus, there is a customer experience guy, and he he put a good post out about Google Plus, saying he didn't think ultimately it would take off because it uh, it targeted itself at um, technical geeks more than it did at the average person that was looking for an alternative for Facebook. So then it would find a limited short time appeal for those techno geeks, but then when it tried to go mainstream, it really didn't really think of the overall user experience of everybody else. Um, mm. I can't really myself though comment on that because I haven't gone in and played with that myself. See, that's a, that's a really interesting perspective because I, when I use Google+, I love it because it is suited to my workflow. Uh, you know, there's a way for yeah. me in a Google Doc or a Gmail uh, tab to just kind of check and see like, oh, look, Nathan Jackson just mentioned me in a post. You know, I can, I can even click and see which post and all of that stuff if I want to know uh, without leaving my interface. But, you know, that's as it, what's it's interesting you're saying is that that's a really geeky thing. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, you know, tying it back to what you're saying, Leslie, is, you know, the really geeky people are very demanding about what they want from these social networks and so therefore get bored and move on and that could explain the cycles that we see where people move on from Friendster to MySpace to, to whatnot. Uh, but then you combine that with people uh, who are not so into technology who've tried these things and they get scared off by this privacy stuff. You could have a multiplier effect with pe where people just say, you know what, I'm, I'm shattering, I'm going off into my own direction and, and nobody ends up a winner. I mean, until my mom stops asking me what Google Plus is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's you know it we it it's caught on, but um, but I, I suppose privacy is the new currency these days, yeah. is what they're saying. And, and, and people and are. What yeah. amount of privacy do we really have, and what is all kind of theater? You know what I mean? And, you know, it's hard to tell. I I think there's a there's more information about you out there on the web than you care to even imagine. Yeah, wow. but, but how much of that do we really need to worry about? And how much of it is, is, is actually you know, dangerous and how much of it is something that seems like a bad idea to be out there but just it ends up being irrelevant? Sure, I guess, uh, and I think people are a little bit desensitized to that now. Um, we're kind of at a point where people have realized, okay, there's information out there about me on the web. And whereas maybe a few years ago, uh, people would prefer to not have personal photos on the internet. Now they're publishing them by choice. Yeah. 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 So those standards lighten up over time, but I, I'm, Tom and I kind of land in the same place when it comes to, to general privacy on the internet. I just think it's interesting. To me, it's more about the cycle of 
we just need an excuse to not like Facebook right now. And it's interesting because I, I, I have a teenager and, a, and all of her friends come over and they all hang out. And, and there's always these conversations that come up about Facebook. And my, my daughter will go, my dad's using Google Plus a lot now. And they'll go, they don't even, A, they either don't know what it is or B, they're staunchly against anything but Facebook. And I, and I think it's interesting that, that Facebook does kind of have to worry about what the younger generation thinks about its product. And right now, they're kind of all in. They really like but it. But that was true of MySpace a few years ago, wasn't it? That's true. That's totally true. And, I, and it's, so they're fickle also, and they're also, they'll turn on a dime. And, and so I, I feel like the group they need to keep the happiest are my mom's group and my kid's group. Mm. Because those are the two groups that are spending money in, you know, Farmville. They're the ones that are on there all day. They're sending messages back and forth and texting and what, and what have you. And when they're not happy is when you get in trouble. And I think that's kind of what happened to MySpace. And they came in and stole their thunder. I don't even know if Google wants that. Well, I think they do want that. But I don't know. What, they're not really showing me right now that they really want that. But to me, that, that, those two groups will determine whether Facebook can do what they need to do over the next couple of years. And the privacy thing will, will, will either be a big deal for those two groups or it won't matter at all because they're, again, the bread and butter, I think, of that, of that whole company. All right, let's move over to you, Joyce. Your short-term prediction, things you think will happen sooner rather than later. What do you got for us? I was thinking about labels. Um, in that someone had mentioned to me that in a bookstore now, they can go in, they can just point the, the scanner at the book and get a bunch of information about that book. And I know that you can hook up on your Mac and do that sort of thing. And, but what if when you show on your mobile phone at any label in any grocery store, in any product store, you really got a whole bunch of the story around that product, how it was made, what's the company like, um, if it came from a farm, um, all that sort of information and almost even extending past what the company itself might put up there because companies put up stories, maybe some better than others about who they really are and then connect that in with something like Google News that really went out there and did a wider search and connected that back in. So you got the whole picture of what you were buying and then over time could say, no, I like this or I reject that sort of thing. So it got to know your preferences as to what your ethical thoughts about products were or how they were made or where how they were growing so that's right. my so, short-term prediction so jo joyce you do gardening um you've mentioned that already yes. on the show do you also grow a, a bunch of your own food you have that kind of garden uh, i grow a bit of my own food but it takes like more consistency and watering and stuff so that's more of <laughs> my my growth curve where i'm trying to go more to sure. the vegetable i've got a few fruit trees and so i'm working on those but yeah, I want to do more of that, but I'm not great yet. So I'm visiting well, farmers in our market right the, now. The reason I ask, and we had this conversation with my sister yesterday, she's growing a bunch of their own food now, and they have fruit trees as well, and they're kind of trying to do that more for many reasons. But one of the reasons is they're they're it's not a paranoia thing, but they're they're concerned that they really don't know where their food's coming from. And so I know that my sister, in a heartbeat, they would take their, their iPhones right now and go to a store and scan stuff and would love to know, is this truly organic? Is this truly free range? Is this truly all those things that they're yeah. looking for uh, as consumers? I worry that there's not enough people who are, are concerned about that. Do you feel like we're going to need a bunch of new awareness? Or what, what will lead people to go, yeah, we demand a feature like this in our phones or our technology or whatever? I think you know, just see the movement in the organic movement, or the the growth of the organic movement over the past, you know, I don't know, five years ago, you didn't see much in mainstream grocery stores that was organic. And now you're seeing, even in our kind of no frills chain, you're seeing organic section of food and blue line blue line labels, which is a healthy label in one of our grocery store chains. And that to me indicates more of an interest from consumers that they really are starting to pay more attention to this. And sure, maybe everyone won't care right away, um, but there's probably enough already. And I think it is growing where there is more, there's more who did it, why, the, the backlash against Nike and who they were using um, in their extended network, their um, supply chain. and when you see a movement like that happens and then with um, Twitter and with other social media channels, the ones that are doing things more, that's already spreading that way. So I'm, I'm thinking that, I don't know if there need to be a big awareness thing, but as it starts springing up, people would, it would spread and it would grow. So I don't know. 
Mm. Le Leslie, is that something that, that you would take advantage of if you were able to, to scan stuff and get that kind of a complete history? I get, not even just of food. I think it was interesting what you're saying about Nike, you know, your clothing and, and, and stuff to make a more informed decision. I definitely think when it comes to food, it's it's something that um, I would be interested in personally. Uh, for example, there's a bodega down the street from me that, um, I mean, it's just it's like a convenience store. That's New York but for the, corner it, store to be. Yeah, it's, called, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's called um, Williamsburg Organic Food. And the picture is like greasy eggs, uh, bacon, like French toast, food that to me does not... Um, connote organic right and and so the point is people tend to throw the term organic around and the food might not be organic i think that um a lot of people would like to know you know what does organic mean and is this truly organic i yeah, I, it, I, it, I honestly think uh i i would like to know it not even just for organic foods but but you know i i, I believe that it, it's it's good to buy locally when you can i think you get often a higher sure. quality of food but i don't think it's sustainable for the entire world to only ever buy local so you know i know that i'm going to have to buy some foods that come from a long way but i'd still be fascinated to know well okay of these of these foods that aren't grown locally where are they coming from what countries grew them how long did they take to get here i think almost for me that's mm -hmm. more important than when I see the Neiman Ranch, I kind of know their story. That's, you know, the, their their meats uh, are well documented. But this other sort of faceless food that's out there, and not the box stuff, but the fresh stuff, you know, where did those tomatoes come from? I have no idea. And it's also the issue of the, the, the brands and the makers and the producers of the food you're talking about have a vested interest in making sure the best possible message is conveyed. So if I scan a box of Ritz crackers and it says it's 45% sawdust and, you know, two pounds of elephant fat, I don't want <laughs> Ritz crackers anymore, right? So not that that's what Ritz are made of. I'm not trying to piss off any Ritz lovers, but you know what I'm saying? Like we are they, not they, saying they, Ritz are made of sawdust. <laughs> right, but Nabisco has, it, Nabisco wants me to have the best possible picture so i worry about who would provide it it almost needs to be a third party thing so like yelp does for a restaurant as an example it would be cool if there was a service for just the myriad of possible foods and it almost sounds like as i'm saying it this should already exist like if this doesn't exist i might be a little surprised but i should be able to go to a store scan a box or some kind of name brand something and have it say well these guys are known for child labor law problems in south america the the plantations where they make this stuff but other than that it's made fresh and, blah, 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 and give it some kind of score I think that would be great, but it needs to be this independent voice and not the companies themselves who are saying only the farm freshest eggs in our, you know, thing and, 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 and have loose interpretations of what things like that mean. So to so me, like a that's Wikipedia the Wikipedia for food, food and product data and for database. Yes, but it would have to be better than Wikipedia even because as I learned last week, people can go into, the, into your profile and within seconds, they can say you were born on Mars and you're 109 years old. Yeah, but that stuff gets fixed pretty quickly. It's pretty quick. You just don't want to be that guy at the store scanning and <laughs> right at that time. Yeah, I suppose yeah. that's true. <laughs> Do you think that is that does that fit into your your vision of this, Joyce? Sort of a crowdsourced uh, database? Uh, it definitely does because I I mentioned that something like the Google News thing that pulls across. Yeah, so yeah. whether it's pulling across from a whole bunch of different people's postings in different areas, or whether it's a crowdsourced specific body that does it. It definitely needs the balance of the organization's story and the story that exists out there in the wider web. And do those stories match or is there um, a tension between the story? And then if so, that really indicates that the organization's story isn't, um, it's a marketing story versus a real right, story. Right, right. I mean, you can't, there is such a thing as too much information where you just end up confused because you get all of these competing assertions about something. Uh, so there needs to be some uh, some amount of vetting uh, somehow. All right, let's move on to our long-term predictions. And Joyce, we'll stick with you. Uh, these are more of the the uh, in a hundred years or more sort of thing. What do you got for us now? Um, organizations. I've been thinking about organizations, and I don't know if this has come up on you. Probably come up on your show before, but. Where are organizations going? I think organizations as they are now came out of the industrial era and they're passing their time in, ter in terms of their current structure and their current way that we measure. Where we're measuring against, um, especially public organizations, 
and where it gets shareable value. And there is some, in some areas, and maybe young people and stuff, a rejection of organizations. I don't think we need to go to rejections of organizations because they really helped us build our society and many of us work for organizations. But what does the organization of the future look like? And does it become more of a, I don't know, we, we've been very rational and very assembly line and very um, hierarchical. And can it become where, the, where organizations are more like social organisms and our measures, and I know triple bottom line has been one of the discussions of new types of measures, but new types of measures around what is a successful organization. And then it's much more interconnected with society than they are right now where you know, it's all been about product. Instead of being about product, um, an organization itself is more about the service and the experience of whatever that wider experience is gives, gives to people. So it's not like yeah. a very tight prediction here, but, mm. um, and I don't think it's near term because changing organizations is a fairly massive uh, scale. But the lifespan right now, I read a recent thing about the lifespan of the current organization. It's gone down to about six years from it used to be 20. So it's really dropped the lifespan. And that's one of the indicators that I think it needs to change. Plus the way that organizations have been so separated from how we treat um, the earth, the environment, and people. People need more than their current, you know, people want purpose in their work as well as in their lives. And how can we by changing our organization, have more purpose-driven work. That's interesting, because what your prediction seems to support even history, which is the companies, organizations, um, affiliated groups tend to survive longer if they've got a strong culture of, um, I, I'll, I'll use an example like, I don't know, let's just say Google, because we've been talking about Google. Google's got a strong culture of innovation and giving people the power to be really creative and innovate all the way down to the lowliest employee. And, and I've never been at Google and I've never worked there, so I can't really confirm that all of that talk is true, but it seems like successful companies and organizations, it be they, you know, organizations des designed to make money or organizations designed to do charity or whatever, they seem to survive longer if they have a good uh, structure or a good culture in place that, that you know, um, that, that prompts up those, those kinds of values that you talked about. And here's, so here's the question for you. I throw it back to you. How can, any ideas on how we can do more of that? How can, can that even be regulated? Can, is it enough to say, oh, we recognize your organization as someone who is really good at this one thing. Let's say it's uh, employee satisfaction or happiness or whatever those, those guidelines are. How do we do that in a way that is really meaningful so that it's so that, you know, being awarded that is, you know, uh, it's like a Pulitzer Prize or something. It's something that, that really has meaning. How do you implement that? I don't know if it's, uh, you can just go out and implement that. I think new sorts of organizations start springing up where somebody experiments and there's experiment like Zappos is one of the famous ones right now that experimented with a customer service first driven, strongly value driven um, culture. And using that culture, they attracted employees, they really um, attracted customers. And in an area where you wouldn't have thought that they, you know, some new organization could come and be successful, they were very successful. Um, there's other organizations where they're experimenting with how closely, and there's a book called Design Driven Innovation, which I thought was really interesting. And they looked at where some of the most innovative organizations were. And they were actually based on location. And they were organizations that where the academic institutions, the um, public institutions or the um, public organizations and the companies, there was a lot of cross overlap between them. And it, it ended up having a pocket of creativity. So it's not just within the organization that these people are kind of thinking, but they're interacting with the people within the communities and the nonprofits and the government institutions and universities and across those three um, you get much more of concern for the community and how the organization fits within the community which fits within the you know wider society so i think building those closer connections and having a really strong 
mission or purpose for that organization and then letting things adapt or evolve based on that strong mission vision and that connection with the community. I wonder if uh, if organizations, uh, just kind of taking your thought and running with it a, a little farther, become less about the things we're used to. Right now, organizations yeah. broadly are either governments or non-governmental organizations or they're corporations. Uh, and and I think, uh, you know, where, where what you're talking about is pointing towards is, is a place where organizations find new purposes that are more quality of life oriented. This is kind of a, a sustainability line of thought where, you know, the idea of profit and market driven uh, economies is meant as a guarantee that our quality of life uh, goes up, but it's, but it's a proxy for that. And, and the, there's a lot of people in the sustainability movement that think we'd be better served actually directly measuring quality of life and, and valuing that uh, over the proxy. And that doesn't mean you don't have free markets. It means that you have free markets where they actually improve the quality of life. Of course, the debate then becomes all about you know, what is a, what is a uh, good quality of life versus a bad one. Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie, what do, you, what do you think, you know, from the, from the East Coast? Uh, you, you've got lots of, or lots of uh, you've got the financial industry out there. You've got lots of organizations. Do you ever see them uh, moving towards that kind of organization, like a Zappos customer-oriented sort of experience? Um, man, I think um, they're... It depends, like which what kind of organization you're looking at, but financial sector for sure. People are pretty unhappy with the way things are going right now. But um, it's kind of hard, I think, to change the status quo, and you got to have a lot of intelligent people at the top that are willing to lead that. I think um, you look at the the oil industry as well, um, with the way that affects, like gas prices, for example. Um, constantly fluctuating, but until we have someone that's going to make it, it an economic incentive, which I mean, I hate to say that that's a big factor of it, but I think like the underlying issue is um, people don't want to make change when there is no economic incentive. And, and I think like you can draw parallels there with uh, both the financial sector as well as the oil industry right now, which are to things that people are talking about. Well, no, I've, I completely agree with this. In fact, if you end up being an organization or a company that is winning based on good culture and good ideals and being better parts of their community and so on, that is an, that's a competitive advantage. So if, if Apple, for example, wants to compete better, they've decided one of the, the ways they do that is really good uh, customer service. They do it here in the States for their US customers. There's a, there's a lot to be said about that, the way that affects customers. And they're always really high on these customer satisfaction lists as a result. Well, that's a competitive advantage. It gets them more money. They're not doing that because maybe a little bit, but they're not doing it purely because it's a good thing to do and it's the nice thing to do. They do it because it means that they'll succeed, especially in the long run. If they, you know, this is a competitive advantage for them, and it might be a better advantage over calling Dell support when I talk to somebody in, you know, New Delhi in the middle of the night, and it's not the same kind of experience. I don't feel like you get the same kind of care. So they're doing a good thing that 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 gives people a sense of well, this is this is really good service, and this is how people should treat each other. But at the end of the day, they are driven by the bottom line that that brings. And I think that that's probably going to be the case all around. Even if you're a, a you're Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, your, your ability to be a really important, well-funded, well-followed um, organization and ph philanthropy de depends on you doing great things. And so if you wipe out malaria in a country, yes, Bill may be saying that is the thing I really wanted to do, but that also just boosts the longevity and the ability for that organization to survive, survive and be strong. So I completely agree with you, Leslie. I don't know how we get, a, get away from that being an incentive. I just think it, it is, whether it's, whether it's charity or it's for profit, it's, yeah. it's kind of the I same. I think everything is a brand. Um, whether you like it or not. And uh, there, you know, especially like the way that we're constantly advertised to now, even if you don't know it, you're being advertised to. And I think that like there's a, there's a, a, want, a desire to maintain a brand and an identity as a brand. 
Joyce, how does Someone, that? How does that? How do you respond to the that this this end of the conversation? How does that fit into your prediction? Um, and I mean, organizations need to make money. Um, what percent of profit? And how short term versus long term focused? Right now, organizations are really short term focused, and predictions or profit are based on predictions of what happened in the past. And what are the measures that we use to measure an organization, and can those measures change over time? So uh, I don't know if I'm even answering this, but people people will vote with their yeah. So money money will never go away. Um, people vote with their wallets, but when they choose to vote with their wallets, what goes into those decision making things? And organization can that can look beyond um, the corner to look to two, three, five years out and say, this won't make me as much money this quarter, but this will really set me up for three years from now, five years from now, and keep me growing over time or keep me active over time. And so just, I guess, yeah. Yeah. It just, it just takes someone actually willing to value that time scale over the, the short-term return in the next quarterly report. It's like that Amazon yeah. clock we talked there's, about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah and there's actually um, a Harvard prof, and she used to teach Harvard MBAs, and she quit. I don't know what she's doing right now, but she wrote a really good article for, um, I think it was Business Week, saying how they really done a disservice to North America with the MBA education and how they really need to rethink um, what a business education looks like. And um, one of the new areas that's really coming up in the MBA education is design schools and thinking from a design perspective where you approach a problem not just from the financial perspective, but you approach it from more of a, it's a big wicked problem with all these different aspects flowing into it and how do you tackle it a piece at a time and look outside the current box to do it. I don't think they have the answers for it yet, but yeah. they are starting to question the traditional approaches that they've taken. All right, let's move to you, Leslie, your long-term prediction sort of on the, you know, flying car part of the timeline. What do you see? Actually, funny you say flying, because I think we're going to see some changes in commercial travel. Imagine being able to go from L.A. to Thailand in six minutes. Um, six just minutes? Past, just imagine it. <laughs> okay, sweet. <laughs> it would be sweet. cool, right? Yeah. So yeah. this past yeah. week, um, DARPA, the, the defense, the Pentagon's basically experimental um, defense technology agency. The people who brought the internet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> tested um, unsuccessfully, however, a um, super fast glider capable of, if it works, reaching speeds up to Mach 20. And yeah. they say that it could travel, it, theoretically, anywhere in the world in under an hour. If, and they say if you can, can keep some, track of it. Yeah, see, and this is the problem. It's called the, the HTV2. Um, and they say, in theory, it would be able to travel from New York to L.A. in 12 minutes. And... That's something I could get down with. And uh, I think if they, you know, they, this was their second test and it was unsuccessful um, because once it left the atmosphere, it was so fast they lost track of it. The aliens took um, it. it. That's what I said. Um, <laughs> but uh, suppose they could find a way to keep track of it. I think it could really change the way that we travel. And I love uh, that. <laughs> yeah, heck yeah. I mean, uh, we uh, we always get a little, well, maybe it's more crazy ass predictions we get, but we get a lot of predictions about teleportation and, you know, those kinds of things. But it's the interim stuff that, that really fascinates me. And that not working, that being a failed test, doesn't mean much to me. It means that we're at least poking at it and eventually we'll, we'll, we'll get it. But I'm concerned... I don't want to, like, that sounds like a horrible ride to me. Like, tw Mach 20, I might, what, does your face fall off? I mean, I don't know how that works with people yet. Inertial dampers. If, if you have motion sickness, you should not travel in an HTV too. Yeah, yeah, I think I'll skip it for a while. These prototypes are not for me, but but I'm, I love the idea that we'll start thinking outside of the four wheels on the road or the two wings in the sky kind of mentality that we have now and start thinking of creative ways uh, to get to places, and I don't know what those are going to be. I love this idea. 
Uh, Joyce, what's your what's your take on the future of, of transportation, especially air travel? We have to solve to do that six minute travel thing, the whole security. Uh, like two hours at security. Two hours, yeah. <laughs> As otherwise, it doesn't help us much. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can't have travel that takes less time than the, the line at the TSA. There's got to be yeah. some kind of parity there. But that's an interesting point, actually, also is like, are we, you know, I, I, we just need to think of it in such a different way that there's no there's no longer a captain per se. There's no, this could be an automated trip, and there's no longer flight attendants bringing me nuts. They you know, have time for them. Yeah. right? Just robots. make this as wham bam. I'm in there. I'm out. I you know this is as this idea is as close as we get to teleportation until it you know until we actually get it, and until Tom's you know inertial dampers come out, <laughs> until those get released. Yeah. Uh, Plus, am I going? Am I going LAX to to LaGuardia, or am I going like <laughs> Newark to Burbank? I mean, it makes a difference uh, at the other end. I mean, if you ask me, you're going LaGuardia to LAX. All right, good. <laughs> then I'm in. <laughs> yeah. And flight attendants are nicer in this scenario as well. They don't have to deal with you as long. They're going to be nicer. <laughs> Six minutes. Yeah, true. All right, uh, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, Netflix. Uh, you get unlimited TV shows and movies streaming to all your devices, your phone, your tablet, your computer, your game console, your Apple TV, your Roku. You can watch them on your TV. Some of the TVs even have Netflix apps built in. Try it for free right now. Tell your friends, netflix.com slash twit. Free 30-day trial. All the movies and TV shows you can eat. Well, don't eat them. Don't swallow them. Just watch them. <laughs> All the movies and TV shows your eyeballs can eat. How about there you that? go. Netflix.com slash twit. We thank them for their support. All right, and we're going to move on to the crazy-ass predictions. One really far out there forecast. And, Leslie, you're going to lead us off. What's your craziest prediction? Okay. I, I don't know if any of you guys have ever had um, your wisdom teeth taken out. I've just but recently, it's pretty... actually, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. It depends how many wisdom teeth you have. I actually wasn't born with any, so I'm never going to have to have this. But... A lot of my friends have had it, and pretty simple process. You go in, um, you know, in and out, and some days, you know, it's a day surgery. I think we're going to have cell phones implanted in our schools in, in much the same fashion, uh, you know, maybe 300 years from now. Um, but then, you know, imagine you could just, like, say, like, a, you could have a command, or you could just kind of click your temple or something, and you could answer the phone. <laughs> I love that. And then, you know, I mean, you could also have, like, Pico projectors or something coming out of your fingers. So you can well, okay, straight. so are they going to, so the wisdom tooth part, I'm still trying to tie the two together. Are we going to use the, the space those teeth took up to put in this new hardware? I just mean it's, like, much the same process. It's like a day surgery. You right. go in, it's like, oh, I'm getting my wisdom teeth out. Oh, I'm getting a smartphone embedded into my skull. Right, it's that <laughs> level of surgery. You could even get a two-for-one. Yeah. You exactly tonsils too if they bother you. Take it all out and put in a cell phone while you're there. Interesting. I we were I was having this conversation with somebody. We've been watching a lot of Star Trek Next Generation around here on Netflix and uh, being reminded that the communicators they use are all over the place. You never know really what the proper way is to use them. They're using them twenty different ways to Sunday, and I just I'm trying to imagine a day where. Like, how do you, does anyone else know it's ringing? Are you just hearing it in your, in your new little implant? Are you just hearing a little ring in your ear and you go, oh, excuse me a second, I got to take this and touch your temple and walk the other way? Like, what's the plan there? How do you, how are you going to do that practically? Yeah, that's a, that's going to take years of research or uh, some change in social habits because what's the etiquette there? <laughs> you know, can you answer it at the dinner table if it's not ringing and only you can hear it? <laughs> Hold on, I got to take this. Take what? Yeah, but. But, you know, I saw um, this fall an article in the New York Daily News about, you guys might have seen this, um, there's a, a fashion house that has a dress that has a cell phone in the, in like the sleeve of the dress. So you could just say hello. And wow. there you have it. Very, very chic. Yeah, so I, that's going to evolve, I guess. I, you know, I, I can absolutely see this happening. Uh, they're working on the ability to even control things like cursors with just brain activity. The, we actually had a guy on uh, triangulation, uh, Miguel Nicolelis, who's doing this, this kind of research uh, that allows you to, you know, with just some, some sensors on your head, uh, do hands-free control of a computer. So that, that part could happen. That, that's, that technology is, is very close already uh, and then you can you know you can definitely put in some bone conducting 
so you can hear the ringing and stuff without anybody else hearing it. That it's all plausible. Uh, the question is, Joyce, are you going to put one of these in your head? <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't want to. I have a hard time answering my phone too much right now. I don't want to be that connected. I want to be. Um, I don't know. I, I want to have that space between me and the network. I get more that way as time goes on. Like I'm, I, I hate my phone as a phone. I like it more as a data device because I, I get to time shift everything. And if somebody's calling me like right then at a bad time or whatever, I just hate answering calls. And so I, I'm kind of with you on that. But there's already this thing going on with people's Bluetooth headsets, right? So you always know a guy who's doing that. He's standing at the mall and he's doing this sort of thing. Yeah. And you go, excuse me. And he'll go with a finger and stare off into space. And I hate it. This seems like this will be way worse than that because everybody will be doing that finger thing because you'll never know when they're available. So what needs to come with this is another implant in your forehead that says, you know, no vacancy or something blinking some kind of light something has to happen to let me know well, that you're on the stink phone it's like a recording studio yeah you know you right. got the red light leslie oh, already yeah. she's she's figured this out already she said we'd have pico projectors in your hand so when he holds up the finger it'll actually project onto your retina busy <laughs> <laughs> wow all right sign me up i'm ready see Buy and I, you know what you bring up a good point scott which is i i don't use my phone as a phone hardly yeah. ever uh, I use it as a data device. So, you know, is does that fit into your prediction, Leslie? Are we going to be able to project the screens and play games and post to you're Twitter and all that stuff? Be able to surf the internet, like, you know, in the in thin air. You just pull up a, you could pull up Chrome, and you yeah. know, go to Facebook, or whatever. All right, that's it. You, you've that's convinced it. me. A, I'm getting one. The, the future, as predicted by the film Zardoz, by the way, <laughs> I did that in Zardoz. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Joyce, we'll move on to you. Something like in 2,000 years, we'll all be made of wheat or something. What's your crazy prediction? Mm, I thought I'd go back to my gardening roots here and try that we'll grow our houses, we'll grow our workplaces, mm. so we'll grow things that we live in. And I thought that was kind of really crazy ass. And then I decided, well, I should check on the web and see if there's anything about that. And discovered that there's actually this group called Fab Tree Hab. And that's what they're doing. And they're experimenting with growing um, um, prefab houses for humanity out of living things. That, that's pretty funky. That puts that cave idea in a whole new perspective, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of related to that. Yeah. <laughs> So instead, of, so instead of synthetic, you're talking about air, making building materials or, you know, other structural material out of organic material. Did I hear that right? Yeah, that's right. So you have yeah. seeds, you have trees, and you grow those trees into an actual house. Whether it be one tree or whether it be this fab tree hab place is, is um, using grafting across multiple trees where they put a structure for the trees to grow around. Um, <laughs> and then he had a really funny TED talk about then you can use the fatty cells to become the insulation and the sphincter <laughs> muscles to become the doors you. and windows, <laughs> which I thought was a little fun here. Yeah, yeah. But there's actually islands, and I came across this two living islands in some place on, the, on a lake in the border between Bolivia and Peru it is. And the islands are built out of reeds. And they have to create adding up on top of the right islands every year. And then they have watch towers built out of reeds and their houses are built out of reeds. So the whole island is this living structure right now, which I also thought was pretty cool. But um, yeah, so that's mine, is that connects us more closely with the earth, it grounds us, it allows our cities to have nature around us at the same time as it's very sustainable. So there's my future, my crazy ass one. Slow growth I, homes. Yeah, I love this idea. I like the idea that we could be, you know, the, the process of what plants need to do to survive and generate oxygen and, and, and that whole cycle could happen with the things we live in. And if we could make those things we live in still sustain things like electricity and plumbing and all the things that we, you know, are sort of hooked on now as modern conveniences, we don't all have to become total hippies. The idea is that the house itself could be this something more than just wooden stuff. I mean, I, I, I look at a house as a, as this totally temporary thing. Like one day, this is all going to be not structurally sound. It may be 50, 60 years from now. I don't know, but, but it will. And a living, breathing home seems to have all kinds of benefits to not just the environment, but to 
to the people living in it and the sustainability generally of, you know, the lifestyles we all want. So, yeah, this is this is a I like this one a lot. What do you uh, what do you think about this one, Leslie? Is this a just a future you want? You want to live in a tree? If I woke up tomorrow and my apartment was a tree house, I'm not going to lie to you. I would be psyched about it. <laughs> um, I think it, no, I think it sounds really cool. I mean, if we could, you know, you see a lot of rooftop gardens now, um, it, especially here in New York, like it's, a, I feel like I see a lot of them because we don't have a lot of space. And, um, also it's a, it's a great way to, Oh, a great way to what? Oh. The call. Talk about suspense. No doubt. Will yeah. we ever know? The trees are trying to stop her from talking <laughs> I, you know I, it's funny how many times we've done predictions on this show where someone uh, writes in and says that actually already exists or that's very close to existing Joy so that, it's interesting that you found an organization that's actually close to this this kind of thing it's not as crazy as you thought originally yeah and then I also found another one where they built and I guess it goes way back to when they built root bridges in India by, and they take a rubber tree and they train the roots to grow over a river. And then after 15 years, they have a bridge, a really strong bridge in an area where they couldn't build normal bridges. And they've been doing that for centuries. So, yeah. Well, yeah. It's it's not that far off. And by the way, we are trying to get yeah. Leslie back. Uh, we haven't given up on her. Uh, but... You know, it's not it's not that far off to, to, to think about things when you were mentioning islands. I mean, a lot of islands are just coral Hi, islands to begin with. Okay. All right. You were cut off in mid-sentence, leaving us <laughs> in dire suspense. What were you about to say? Uh, oh, I, I, rooftop gardens. Um, yeah, you know, you see a lot of rooftop gardens right now, and I think jumping off from... Um, <laughs> um, so it, that was, I thought that was just in my head, my implant. Sorry. I, I didn't <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Touch your I, temple, I Tom. Oh. I need to take, take this. this. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> no, I, but jumping off from there, you know, I think it's it's not too far off because, uh, yeah, I think, like, it would be a great way to be sustainable. And it'd be cool. I'm imagining, like, a lost Robinson Crusoe kind of scenario. Um. Uh-oh. We've got, a, uh, we've got an answer machine message. The person leaving the message probably doesn't realize they're streaming live right now. So. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm on a speakerphone. <laughs> Not only Pico projectors, but Pico speakers as well. You have to open your mouth to be speakerphone. I love that idea. All right. We need to bring this all back to some focus now, Scott Johnson. What do you say we do four questions? Four questions. That's our chance to ask our guests four questions, rapid fire style. They do not have a chance to sit and think about it too much. They must answer from the gut, but we hope they're both sitting comfortably. Joyce, I'm asking you my questions. Are you mm -hmm. sitting comfortably? I am. All right, Joyce, here you go. Question number one, would you sign off on a future where we grew all our own food on our backs? <laughs> no. Oh, man. In, in our just, living spaces, yes, but not in our back. <laughs> you just stand in the shower. You get your little water in it. I'm telling you, it's the way to go. A little back mushroom. Yeah, I've already got shrooms on my back, as it is. Gross. Uh, <laughs> actually, I really don't. Next up, why won't, <laughs> why won't teleportation, why, excuse me, why won't teleportation be a good idea? Uh, you don't know where you're going to land. I don't know. You can appear anywhere. Yeah, that would be bad. Inside in a brick wall. Anything. Or yeah. you don't get put together in the right way. Yeah. yeah. If uh, Dr. McCoy left out. Yeah, if Dr. Oh. Leonard McCoy taught me anything, it was to be afraid of teleporters. Uh, will leech therapy ever make a big comeback in the medical world? Oh, uh, yeah, maybe. Mm. I can see leeches for certain things. I think more natural remedies will come back in the medical field and... Not leeches in terms of sucking all your blood out, but leeches in certain circumstances, maybe. All right. Simon I'll H. in the that. chat room says it works on edema. Oh, really? Yeah. Still a working therapy for that. I guess so. It also worked on Will Wheaton and his friends in Stand By Me. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> uh, finally, you and Abraham Lincoln are on the moon. There is a chess set there. Who moves first? Um, me and... Abraham Lincoln are on the moon with a chess set. Yeah. I'm not a chess player. Not me. I'm not going to move first. So Abe, right. Abe moves first and you never move. All right. Uh, I'll respond. I'll have to move, okay. I guess. But. All, right. 
All right. Well, congratulations. Those are your four questions. Tom, I hand it to you, sir. All right, Leslie, are you sitting comfortably? Yes. Good. Then we will begin. Question number one. Can wars fought by robots replace human fought wars? Oh, I hope so. Um, as long as they don't evolve to be smarter than us. Uh, but yeah, it would be great to avoid the loss of human life. Wouldn't that be something if, if we actually we create robot armies and we have robots fighting our wars and then they actually figure out, what are we fighting for? And they just throw down their arms and turn on us. <laughs> Didn't Will Smith already uh, star in a movie about that? That's, I, Robot? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much Isaac Asimov all over, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> yeah. yep. All right, question number two. In the future, what planet will Texas conquer? <laughs> um, it, if you ask me... And I am. Well, I don't know, but if you ask Texas, Texas would probably say every planet. Um... <laughs> But, you know, I think uh, <laughs> Texas' ego might be its own downfall mm. in that scenario. All right. Uh, then we'll move on to question number three. In the future, what planet will Brooklyn conquer? Oh, <laughs> Brooklyn's <laughs> taking over the entire universe. Um, mm. Yeah, we're like the biggest... Have to fight uh, Texas for it. Yep. Yeah. And Brooklyn's Planet like the, Texas. The, one of the biggest um, ta like cities in the... If it were its own city, it would be one of the biggest geographic areas. What, what planet do you think fits it best, though? Oh, Brooklyn is Mars. It is? Because, you know, Brooklyn's a little bit, I think Mars, and I think Mars is a little bit, it's the red planet, it's a little bit weird. Yeah. It's Brooklyn. And you can get to Mars on the L train, a lot of people don't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just don't go during rush hour. Yeah, exactly. It gets really backed up. It takes you months, literally, to get there. Uh, question yes. number four. <laughs> Space elevators. What will lead to us finally getting space elevators? Oh, you have to ask Willy Wonka that question. Mm. Um, <laughs> what will lead to us getting space elevators? Well, we would have to um, have commercial control over the gravity market. Um, someone would have to learn how to harness gravity and sell it. Whoa. Wow, commoditized gravity. Yeah, gravity yeah. is currency. That's a crazy idea. I love that. All right. Excellent. Thank you for answering our four questions. Thanks for having me. And that is it uh, for Forecast. Thanks, uh, both of you guys. This was an excellent conversation. Loved having you on. Uh, Joyce, let folks know where else they can find what you do online. Um, I've got my blog, JoyceHoston.com. Kind of post sporadically. I'm on Twitter, Joyce underscore Hoston. And I've got a slide share area too so you can find me any of those spots excellent and uh leslie let folks know uh where they can find you i'm a news reporter for pcmag.com so go to pcmag for all your tech news um unless you're looking at twit of course but um then you can find me on twitter at les horn um also on facebook i'm les horn and you can also find me on google plus excellent scott johnson Got a, another forecast in the bag, helping us to pay for our gravity bills. Pushing up toward 100, Tom. I don't even know what we'll do with ourselves on that day. But uh, in, in the meantime, we'll enjoy the numbers we still have left before 100. Uh, it was great to be here with you. It's always fun to hang out with you. Excellent. Uh, anything else to uh, to plug, mention, pass along? Oh, I don't know. You know, people, don't forget, Tom and I have this other little thing we do once a week called Current Geek. And uh, every Wednesday, this thing gets posted. People should be checking that out at currentgeek.com. So, yes, today I will pimp that. Also, if you want to follow me on Google+, Plus, go to Google, or I'm sorry, go to frogpants.com slash plus, and you can check out my Google Plus account. And lately, I've been posting a lot of pictures of politicians eating corn dogs. That's all <laughs> you got to say about that. What they do. Those That's what they do. Mm -hmm. well, that's it for this episode of Forecast. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, forecastpodcast.com. That's F-O-U-R, castpodcast.com. Send us an email, same spelling, forecastpodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next time. Tell me stories years away. Way. Hooray! Yay! You guys were awesome. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. That was fun. Well, thank you, yeah.